Hello and welcome to the Biz News Breakfast Briefing. I'm Lucy Ferreira for biznews.com. First off, in today's show, we hear from Alec Hogg with his morning wrap-up of the markets, unpacking the overnight winners and losers, and the events driving those moves both locally and internationally. After that, in case you missed it, South Africa has a newly established border management authority, headed up by Dr. Masia Pato, the commissioner of the outfit currently incubated within Home Affairs. Michael Apple speaks to the commissioner about the future plans of the BMA to secure South Africa's poorest borders. You can find the full interview on biznews.com. Lastly, we have the Global Daily News update from our partners, the FT in London. For now, Alec, it's over to you. Thanks, Lucy. Good morning. It's Tuesday, the 2nd of August. Well, we'll cut that one short because the markets, although down, were really not giving too much pain to investors overnight or indeed here in Johannesburg yesterday. S&P 500 index down by a third of a percent. NASDAQ composite one-fifth of one percent here in in Johannesburg. The all-share index was 0.4 percent lower. The markets bounced around yesterday. Um, American investors taking a breather. That's after a powerful run in July. 12 percent higher on the Nasdaq. Nine percent better on the S and P 500 index. Both of those indices doing their best since April 2020. And you might recall April 2020 was when we had the big bounce that came off the sharp sell-off after the lockdowns were imposed for COVID-19. Feels like another lifetime now, doesn't it? The idea amongst investors in the United States is that the Federal Reserve is going to get inflation under control. Here in South Africa, the RAND has picked up 10 cents overnight against the US dollar. We're trading at 16 Rand 53 cents. No change against the pound, still at 20 Rand and 26 cents, and a one cent improvement against the euro, just edging below 17 Rand. It's now sitting at 16 Rand 99. The Brent crude oil price has been falling rapidly in the last little while. It's now down to below $100 a barrel, and with the increase in the Rand, and the fall in the Brent crude, which is trading now at $99.33, we can look forward to some relief on those petrol prices here in South Africa. The gold price up another $12. It's picked up $100 in the past week. is now sitting at $1,774 an ounce. Bitcoin came back a little, 2% lower overnight, 22911 and that translates into the Jaltec basket being down 3%. At 441 rand and 86 cents. Here in South Africa, we had a trading update yesterday from Tungela Resources Coal Company, which was created by the spin off of the coal assets at Anglo American. And boy, they got to be kicking themselves at the Anglo head office nowadays after seeing the way the coal price has gone up. And indeed, this share has rocketed. Something that is really strange here is that the market is not believing that the profits that are being generated by Tungela or indeed by any coal company are going to last. And let me explain why. The trading update that came out yesterday said that Tungela will earn 67 rands a share. Okay, put that in the back of your mind, double it for a whole year because that was only for six months and that takes us to 134 rand a share. Tungela's share price is at 291 rand. In other words, if these profits last, you will get your money back from investing in Tungela in 2.2 years, a price-to-earnings ratio of 2.2. That is phenomenal. Uh, It's not often that you see this kind of bargain, quote-unquote, but the reason why the Tungela share price is not being driven higher is that the investors believe, or certainly those who would be buying Tungela shares, that the coal uh, boom is not going to continue. The share price of Tungela seems to just be lagging uh, what's been happening in the international coal price. It started the year at 80 rand a share, believe it, and it is now trading at 291 rand. And in mid-July, you could have picked up these shares for 220 rand. Remember, on the numbers that we've seen uh, yesterday that the company told us uh, that 220 rand in mid-July compares with earnings of 134 rand at the current rate of earnings. 
So if you're looking uh, at a continuation of the war uh, between Russia and Ukraine, and although Ukraine has sent out its first grain shipment yesterday, there's uh, a lot going on there. The Russians are now redeploying troops to the south where the south of Ukraine, where the conflict is now switching to. Uh, remember, they've been fighting in the east, but now in the south there's uh, a war of attrition is uh, going to continue into the future. If you believe that that's going to continue and that the Russians are going to keep squeezing Europe and that Europe is going to look for coal from wherever it can find it and that maybe South Africa can start getting its transport and transnet uh, sorted out, well, then there's no reason to believe that the coal price is going to fall anytime soon. And uh, if you think it could be a two-year involvement, well, you could put your money in worse places than Tungela right now. Outside of that, the, yesterday we saw MTN up 2%, Telcom, its target, up one and a third percent Impala Platinum up 2%. And uh, two stocks that I've been watching from the sidelines that have done very well, Huleman was up 14% yesterday. Two Rand 15 is a recent price that you could have bought them at. It's now 263. And we've seen Grindrod up another 4%. This is a stock that has just been going uh, gangbusters. Started the year at 5 Rand a share. It's now 9 Rand 20. Grindrod is in the infrastructure business. Uh, primarily, it's, it's got a, a huge operation in Mozambique, where the Mozambican port of Maputo is now competing with the less efficient South African ports. On the other side, the resources shares here in South Africa gave up a little bit of their recent rally, Kumba down 6.5%. Uh, but remember, this share has gone from 441 Rand to 492 Rand and back to 460 Rand at the moment. So it gives you an idea. They've had a good run. And some of that is now being given back. Same with Anglo-American, down 3.5%. Both of those companies uh, reported results recently. Anglo went from 517 Rand pre-results to 600 Rand, and it's now back to 578. And Sassel, same thing, down 2.6% yesterday. But that's gone from 323 to 350, and then back to 340. And finally, Standard Bank was down by half a percent. And that takes the edge off a very strong rally there as well, which has seen the share go from 147 Rand to 160 Rand. It's now back to 159. In the Asian markets, a little bit of sogginess there. The Nikkei 225 this morning is down 1.5% in Hong Kong. The Hang Seng is down 2.5%. And now for Michael Apple and Dr. Masia Pato on border control. What is the size of the contingent of border guards that have been trained? I saw pictures of them in their, in their uniforms. They're all armed, have bulletproof vests. What, what did their training involve broadly? Um, uh, all the act says is they must be adequate and appropriately trained. What did that involve? Yeah, maybe let me start by saying that uh, the journey of establishing the Border Management Authority in the current financial year, which is 2022-2023, uh, we are currently incubated within the Department of Home Affairs just for this financial year. We are expected to exit the incubation by the 1st of April next year in 2023. Now, what is it that we are doing in the current financial year? We do two things. The first one is the integration, and the integration we've spoken about is to make sure that all those officials working for all those other departments are going to enter through a process of vetting, training, and all of that, and then they will ultimately migrate and be employees of the BMA. That is the first part. But the second part is the one you're talking about, and that is the capacitation. So in the capacitation process, we had to bring in some new people into the environment whilst at the same time doing the integration. So in this instance, we're only given around $67 million by National Treasury to bring in around uh, 200 border guards. So in there, we have uh, chief border guards, we have senior border guards, and we have border guards. So in there, we have basically trained them in all of these various spectrums of work. However, their key area of deployment is then going to be on the vulnerable segments on the borderline. Some of them will also be doing access control. So in terms of training, they had been train trained in a number of things. If you can then talk about soft training, for instance, they've been trained on issues of patriotism 
trained on issues of integrity, trained on issues of ethics, but also trained in terms of the work relating to health, environment, immigration, as well as environment, on the border environment, to understand the entire spectrum. So we trained them that in terms of soft skills. In terms of the hardcore training, most of those people came from the Defence Force and some of them came from the police, some of them came from correctional services and some of them came from uh, some of the metros around the country. They had already been trained and we had to enhance their training in terms of uh, building that collective culture within the Border Management Authority as it were. But in terms of the physical, we did all of the various physical elements of training, as you will know, for any law enforcement uh, agency. So I suppose 67 million rand is an initial budget and 200 border guards, many of them senior. Um, th- there will be a question whether this will be ramped up. Do you have a, a medium term time frame in which you look to get more boots on the ground and more money in the pocket? Definitely. So the issue is, as I said, we are just now under incubation within the Department of Home Affairs. So this period of incubation allows us, as I've said, to do the integration. In terms of capacitation, this is just the first cohort. So currently we are engaged with the department, I mean with the National Treasury, uh, within the context of what is called the medium term expenditure framework. We are then engaging there in terms of what will be our new financial requirement when we become a standalone public entity from the 1st of April next year. Arising from that, we are then doing some uh, mathematical calculations in terms of the number of people that will be coming from the departments, how much is it in terms of their salaries, how much is it in terms of their operational cost, how much is it in terms of the assets and all of that. Once we are busy with all of that, when we are done, we will then, as we are doing now, start identifying what will then be the new money that will be required to further capacitate the, the authority going forward. And we are putting all of those proposals on the table as we speak. We have been engaging with the, with the National Treasury in a number of occasions. But the key is to ultimately demonstrate, arising from what will then come from the department, what will be the new money required. Indeed, there is going to be a new money that will be brought through into the Border Management Authority so that from the 1st of April comes, We now are now operating independent with our own independent budget, and that budget will enable us to then augment the numbers of the border guards on the ground. That is going to be very much critical, primarily because we do appreciate the magnitude of the problem. You will remember in the in the in the in the in our roadmap, for example, we are looking at a almost I would say until 2030 in a way in terms of the roll down, and in each and every financial year will get new money to be able to augment the numbers so that we can ultimately address these issues of porous borders. The Act states a border guard must be a fit and proper person to serve and must have a trustworthy and exemplary character. Commissioner, how are you going to guard against corruption within your ranks? Give us an idea of the sort of ship you're going to captain. So the first thing is um, to accept that point. Um, and I think that one is more wider, in a way, you know, about corruption as it were. But what have we done? Firstly, in terms of this first 200 cohort, we have done very intensive uh, vetting, you know, on them. And that vetting, we did it in collaboration with the uh, state security agents. So that is the most, most thing that we have actually, I would say, done in terms of making sure that the people that we on board are people of grounded character. But additional to that, we have already set through a process wherein we will then be doing continuous lifestyle audits on their lives, you know, as they continue to do this work, primarily in terms of looking at um, their declaration of assets as it is a requirement, arising from that, being able to juxtapose that against the, the, the income that they get and be able to pick up an outlier. In instances where we pick up an outlier, we will be able to deal with that. Good morning from the Financial Times. Today is Tuesday, August 2nd, and this is your FT News Briefing. The head of Instagram is packing his bags and setting up shop in London. Plus, China's impact on global business is impacting our show today. We'll hear about a British bank that's caught in the middle of U.S.-China tensions, and then we'll talk about China's overseas lending. It's exploded over the past decade, and now Beijing faces its first overseas debt crisis. I'm Mark Filipino, and here's the news you need to start your day.
Instagram is relocating its CEO to London to better compete with its key rival, China's short video app, TikTok. Adam Mosseri will move from the California headquarters of Instagram's parent company Meta, formerly Facebook. Meta just reported its first decline in quarterly revenues and expressed concern that Instagram is losing users to TikTok. London is already Meta's biggest engineering hub outside the U.S. FT sources say the temporary move is partly because Mosseri just wants to live in London. It could also be a cost-saving measure since U.K. engineers are generally cheaper than those in San Francisco. One of Europe's largest lenders, HSBC, reported earnings this week, and they were better than expected, thanks to a boost from higher interest rates. And the bank promised shareholders it would raise its dividends back to pre-pandemic levels. This dividend promise is especially important for HSBC. The FT's Stephen Morris explains why. During the pandemic, regulators at the Bank of England stopped HSBC from paying this. Their dividend was so reliable that people counted on it as a source of income. In particular, um, their Hong Kong retail shareholder base, who own about a third of the bank, which is unusual. Um, Usually banks' shareholder registers are dominated by institutional investors or hedge funds. But it also affected their largest shareholder, Ping An, which has gone on a campaign this year to try and break up HSBC. And Ping An is a mainland Chinese insurance company, which also counted on those dividends. Indeed, the dividend ban during the pandemic was one of the main reasons why Ping An went hostile and started trying to call for a breakup of the group because they were fed up of regulators and politicians in London controlling a bank, which makes the vast majority of its earnings in Asia, but in particular Hong Kong, its historic base. So will restoring the dividend and better earnings reduce the pressure on HSBC to break itself up? In a way, if the dividend issue goes back, Ping An, the largest shareholder, starts earning money, it gets its Hong Kong retail shareholder base on side, maybe the immediate pressure for a breakup led by Ping An goes away. But if you look at the bank's position long term, I remember speaking to one investor who said HSBC is in the least sustainable position of any bank in the world. It is headquartered in London. Um, relies on US dollars for funding and also for conducting its massive global trade and foreign exchange operations, but makes almost all of its money in Hong Kong, which is obviously coming under the increased influence of Beijing and the Communist Party. So HSBC finds itself in kind of a stuck between a rock and a hard place. There isn't really much it can do unless geopolitical tensions go away between China, the US and the UK. And there seems to be little chance of that actually happening. Stephen Morris is the FT's banking editor. In the past decade, China has become the world's biggest overseas development lender, way bigger than the International Monetary Fund. It's bigger than the World Bank, the IMF, and all 22 members of the Paris Club put together. Our global China editor, James King, has been covering China's overseas lending program, also known as the Belt and Road Initiative. He found that so many loans are failing, Beijing now faces its first overseas debt crisis. James joins me now to talk more about this. Hey there, James. Hi. So, James, you wrote in your article that not only are many of China's borrowers not able to pay their loans, but Beijing is now extending new loans to help these countries pay off their original loans. China is now extending rescue loans to countries that look like they're about to default on these infrastructure project loans to Chinese state institutions. So it's it's provided tens of billions of rescue loans to countries like Pakistan, Argentina, Belarus, Egypt, Mongolia, Nigeria, Turkey, Ukraine, and Sri Lanka. The infrastructure projects that Chinese state banks lent to are turning bad in record numbers. China doesn't want the governments of those countries to go bust. And that's why it's providing rescue loans directly to those recipient governments. Now, we should probably remind folks that all this lending is part of China's signature foreign policy program called the Belt and Road Initiative. James, does this loan disaster point to a fundamental problem with the way the Belt and Road program is set up? 
Um, we have to be balanced here because there has been more than 13,000 projects, most of them infrastructure, mostly in the developing world, uh, since the Belt and Road uh, Initiative started back in 2013. Uh, some of them have done very well. Um, you know, there are railways across Africa. There are hydro dams. There's all kinds of infrastructure that, that actually has been delivered on time, fairly cheaply, uh, and, and are generating a return. That needs to be stated up front. But there are also a lot of projects and an increasing number of projects now um, that are uh, underperforming, that have problems of corruption, um, problems of you know implementation, uh, are delayed, have financing issues, et cetera, et cetera. And that's one of the reasons why we're seeing so many of these loans go bad in the last couple of years. Now, I'm curious, is there anything about the way China lends that adds to the risk? One of the problems of the Belt and Road Initiative is that it brings together many of the riskiest developing countries in the world. Uh, and uh, the, the bonds issued by those countries are priced in the market at the moment as uh, highly risky. The other aspect of the Belt and Road Initiative is that because most of it is done in secrecy, there aren't, for instance, uh, environmental impact studies conducted, social impact studies conducted on a project-by-project basis. This allows the, the Chinese uh, construction companies that, that build the infrastructure to deliver the project at high speed, and that is very much applauded by developing countries in, in, in most parts of the world. But the drawback comes when problems emerge. Corners are cut in order to achieve speed, but often you have uh, social issues, environmental issues blowing up after the project is already under construction. So, James, this seems like it's a bad look for China. How bad is it? Uh, this is a huge issue for China because the Belt and Road Initiative has been linked to China's uh, leader, Xi Jinping, since the very beginning. Xi Jinping called the Belt and Road Initiative the project of the century. This is China's biggest foreign policy gambit since the revolution in 1949. China's offering to the world, it's China's development model embodied and exported to the world. So uh, now that it is experiencing these serial crises, serial financial crises in several countries, uh, it very much besmirches the image of the Belt and Road Initiative and also the image of China around the world. And what we're seeing is that uh, a lot of Chinese state banks, the big policy banks that have bankrolled this initiative, are really reining in their horns now and taking a second look at it. So James, how does China's lending impact these other multilateral institutions like the IMF or World Bank that are also lending to developing countries, uh, do they interact at all? So this is the next part of the plot that has yet to unfold. What will happen uh, in a developing country all of the international creditors, that includes the World Bank, international bondholders, China, etc., want to know if they're going to get their money back. And crucially, who is going to get paid first? There is a sense that maybe uh, some kind of multilateral solution, multilateral resolution that brings China and the Western-led institutions together might be possible, but uh, that's by no means a foregone conclusion. James King is the FT's Global China Editor. Thanks, James. Thank you very much. You can read more on all of these stories at FT.com. This has been your daily FT News Briefing. Make sure you check back tomorrow for the latest business news. And that's all from the briefing for today. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember to like, subscribe, follow and share wherever you like to listen.